certain <clears throat> sections of Scripture are fairly easy to understand and apply to our lives, and other sections are very difficult to understand and apply to our lives. And the section of Exodus chapter 4 that we're going to look at this morning is definitely in the latter category. <laughs> um, in fact, Exodus 4 raises some very perplexing questions about God, about his sovereignty, his control over the universe. It raises perplexing questions about um, the nature of human free will, the ritual of, of circumcision, as well as God's agreement or his covenant uh, that he's made with his followers. Uh, now, uh, if you don't already know, over, over time you will know that for the majority of the year, my approach um, in my, my preaching aspect of, of my ministry is, uh, is to work through whole books of the Bible, to go section by section and verse uh, by verse through the scriptures. Um, and one of the chief benefits of that is that it, it, it forces all of us to hear all of what God says and not just certain parts. Um, we should not ever take the buffet approach to the Bible. Right, where we just kind of pick and choose those sections, those parts that we like, and, and ignore, um, ignore th those others. Uh, we also don't want to just limit ourselves to the things that are immediately understandable. And if something is confusing, well, we won't worry about it. We'll kind of pass on to the next thing. So um, God has something for us in this very curious section. And so my prayer is that this morning, wherever you're seated, you will um, jump into this with gusto. So um, let's, let's turn to the Lord now in prayer, and then we will uh, uh, we'll, we'll open up this section of Scripture. Lord, your word is, uh, is precious to us, to those of us who know you and love your Son. And yet we have to admit that there are sections of your word that are perplexing to us. And I pray right now that your Holy Spirit, who inspired this word uh, thousands of years ago, would be illuminating uh, the meaning of Scripture uh, to our minds and to our hearts uh, as we study. And we pray that before we, we finish, we would see something wonderful about who you are and especially about who your Son is. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. The human soul cannot tolerate a vacuum. Now, I'm obviously not talking about the, the, the thing, the appliance that we use to, to clean our homes, but rather I mean the human soul can't tolerate an, an empty space or, or a void um, in, in life. Uh, vacuums inevitably get filled by something. So here's what I mean. Let, let's say um, you have a person who has a, a bad habit and that habit takes up a lot of their time. One of the keys for them to break that bad habit is to take that time that they used to spend on the bad habit and apply it to a new habit, right? So, so that there isn't just a, a, an empty space because the chances are by force of habit, they'll, they'll revert to that old thing. Um, I mean, you know, speaking personally in my own case, before I came to, to faith in Jesus about 25 years ago, I spent a huge amount of time partying. And then one day I, I heard the good news. I embraced Jesus Christ as he is, is offered in the gospel. Um, and then I realized that almost all of my time was focused on partying and on wildness and, and living that sort of a life. And I realized I probably needed to find some new activities with which I could fill the time. So, of course, I started attending church and got very involved there. But I also started weightlifting. So for a few years, I spent uh, many, many hours every week. Uh, you, if you look at me now, you wouldn't be able to tell. But anyway, I used to do that a lot. That was how I kind of filled, um, filled, the, filled the void or, or that vacuum. Now, think about the children of Israel uh, as they were enslaved in Egypt. We could pretty much say that all of their time was accounted for, right? So they were just, um, they, they, were, they were busy doing the, doing the bidding of, of Pharaoh their great taskmaster. And so as we, we think about the children of Israel being freed, how will they use, use that time that they used to devote to their being slaves and working in this awful bondage and, and servitude? Um, when they're freed, what will they do to fill that vacuum? Uh, one, one author that I've read uh, has a, a great little expression um, here that, that he uses, and he says that they were saved from something for something. Right? The children of Israel, when they were rescued out of Egypt, they were saved from something for something. That is, they were saved from slavery for worship. Right? So they were called out of slavery so that they might be free and at liberty to, to worship the living God. Um, and what, what I want us to see uh, this morning out of, 
out of Exodus 4 is that the people of the sovereign covenantal God are saved for worship. The people of the sovereign covenantal God are saved for worship. So if you will, please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4, and we will pick up where we left off last week in verse 18. Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. Now, as you're turning there, you will remember, if you joined us online last week, that in the the previous section uh, of of Exodus 4, we saw that God enabled Moses to perform miraculous signs in the presence of Pharaoh and in the presence of the children of Israel so that they would be persuaded that God had, in fact, called Moses and sent Moses on this mission to rescue the children of Israel out of Egypt. We learned about uh, Moses' ability to turn his rod into a, into a serpent and to, um, uh, for his hand to be turned leprous and then, and then made whole again and that he would be able to pour out the waters of the Nile and that would turn into, into blood. And so immediately after that, we pick up in verse 18 where it reads, <clears throat> Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Now, it's, I think, kind of interesting here that Moses goes to his father-in-law, Jethro, and says that he believes he needs to return to the land of Egypt. But it's sort of interesting that he, he mentions, I want to be reunited with my family, but what does he not mention? He doesn't mention that he had this unbelievable encounter with God in the wilderness and that God had chosen him to free his people uh, out of the land of Egypt. So he kind of omits that fact. And, and Jethro basically says, go with my blessing, right? Jethro literally says, go in shalom or, or go in, in peace. Okay, so at this point in the story, it should be fairly straightforward what, what has happened. Moses uh, fled Egypt when he was about 40 years old, uh, when, he, when he killed somebody uh, trying to defend uh, what, you know, the Hebrews. And then he's been for the last 40 years in Midian. Um, and at that time, he, um, has, he's become kind of a domestic man. He, he's gotten married, and he has a couple of children. And God is now calling him to return to Egypt, right? So fairly straightforward what's happened. But in the next three sections that we're going to look at, some very unusual things happen. Uh, these are different scenari- three different scenarios, but all of them, this is an important point, all three of these scenarios in some way are going to really set up the confrontation with Pharaoh and what happens through the end of the book of Exodus. Does that make sense for the five people in here? Okay, perfect. All right, good. I'm just going to talk to you all for right now. Um, Right? So in these next three sections, there's different scenarios, but all of them, in an important way, are setting up uh, Moses' confrontation with Pharaoh and what's going to happen throughout the rest of the book. And the first is we see um, Moses' obedience to a sovereign God. That's first, obedience to a sovereign God. Second is a bizarre death threat. And third is a worshipful reunion. So let's look uh, at verse 18, Moses' obedience to a sovereign God. God, which if you just think about that expression, it's kind of odd, obeying a God who is sovereign. Let's get into it. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Okay, now if you, if, if you understood that, then we have a very perplexing question we have to ask right now. And it's the question, did Pharaoh harden his own heart, or did it God Harden Pharaoh's heart. I mean, the text says, God says in verse 21, I will harden his heart. <clears throat> now, in Exodus, there are 20 places 
at which there's a reference to, uh, to a heart being hardened, to Pharaoh's heart being hardened. And 10 times, get this, 10 out of the 20 times, the text says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And 10 times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. That is, he, he hardened his own heart. So which is it? Okay, this is, this is super important. If the words, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, if that means that it's as if God's hand went into Pharaoh's heart and God created in him an evil heart and then God punished Pharaoh for having an evil heart, that would not be the work of God. That would not be the work of God. In fact, you could argue that would be the work of the devil. That would be a diabolical thing. I, I believe that. That is not what God hardened Pharaoh's heart means. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, let's take a step back. You know, sometimes you're on Google Earth or Maps and you like zoom way out. We're going to zoom way, way, way out and then way far in uh, for, for just the next moment. So, so let's zoom out really far and ask how uh, ask this question. How is it that the whole universe is upheld? Like right now, at, at this moment. How is everything held in being? And the answer is that it is the hand of God, namely Jesus, who upholds everything in the galaxies, all the way from the furthest stars, all the way to you and I and to the molecules. It is Jesus Christ who not only created all of the worlds, but sustains all of the worlds. Now, uh, this comes out of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where the author of Hebrews says this about Jesus. Hebrews 1, 3, Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now that is an unbelievable thought for, for us as humans to try to make sense of. But, but it's, it's nevertheless true that Jesus Christ, his powerful word, is the thing that is holding all of the universes, all of the galaxies together at this moment. Now that's a staggering thought that should lead us to worship. But we'll, we'll come back to the worship of Jesus a little bit later, okay? So, so that's kind of in the broadest sense possible, that God upholds and sustains everything. But let's zoom in on, on you and I, and now we'll ask this specific question. How is faith maintained? How is saving faith maintained in people? And you know what we, we learn in Scripture is that it is also the hand of God who sustains uh, Christians, that is, followers of Jesus Christ, so that their, their faith is maintained. That is through, through God as well. In other words, it is the direct power of God that keeps the universe in existence, and it is also the power of God that causes Christian faith to be sustained. Now, let me show you where I get this. Um, in your Bible, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 1. The Apostle Paul prays as follows for the Christians at Corinth. He prays, starting in verse 7, he prays for them that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, do you get that? So those, those of us who believe, those of us who are trusting Jesus, we are sustained in our faith by Jesus Christ. You get this? So Jesus not only sustains everything, he also sustains your personal, your individual faith. And let me, let me show you one other place in the New Testament where, where this is, is referenced, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. You can turn there if you like. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. This is what the Apostle Peter writes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So just pause for one second. So he's speaking to those who have been born again to a living hope through Jesus. And look at what he says in verse 5. To you who by God's power are being guarded through faith 
for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We who believe are kept by God's power. It is His power which sustains us in our faith. And folks, this is true in the Old Testament just as much as it is true, as it is true in the New Testament. God has not changed. God is unchangeable. So let me, let me draw this together. Therefore, when we, we think about Pharaoh, therefore, God did not need to create evil in Pharaoh's heart for Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. God had only to remove his presence from Pharaoh for his heart to be hardened. So the idea is, is in, in, in God hardening Pharaoh's heart, the idea is that God's hand of mercy was removed from Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh's heart went the way that Pharaoh wanted his heart to go. See, you see the, when, we, when we address a little, a little verse like this, we have to take into account a lot of other things that the Bible says. And one of those is that uh, from, from the... the uh, from, when, when the fall happened, going back in Genesis 3, and right after that, um, the scriptures say in Genesis chapter 6 that God saw that the intention of the hearts of man was only evil continually. So it, for God to remove his hand of mercy from us, what direction do you think that we're going to go? Every one of us, uh, we're going to go toward the evil. We're going to run from God. We're going to flee from God. And so that's what's happening here with Pharaoh. Um, because humans naturally run away from God and we do not run toward Him. Um, this is similar a little bit to 1 Samuel 16, 14. I'm taking us all over the Bible. Bear with me for just a second. But it says this about Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 14 says that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And when the Spirit departed from Saul, Saul turned to his evil ways. This was evil that he chose. This was not evil that God forced him to choose. You see? So that's what it means when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, if this is true, if, if what I've just said is true, then why on earth would God tell Moses to, to bother performing these miraculous signs in order that Moses might prove to Pharaoh that God had really sent him? Like, why bother? God, if you're going to remove your hand uh, your restraining hand from him, why bother doing all these miraculous signs, right? I mean, look at verse 21. God says to him, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. It's like, well, why, why bother, Lord? Um, I, I think that Moses performing miracles before Pharaoh, um, Moses performing these miracles, which Pharaoh rejected, it provides reasons why God's judgment on Pharaoh is just. You see? So it's sort of providing raw material, so to speak, for God to be able to rightly judge Pharaoh for his wickedness. It's like, Pharaoh, yes, it's true that I've hardened your heart by taking my restraining presence away from you, but nevertheless, you've done what you've wanted, and in your heart you have rebelled against me. You have continued to resist me. See, Pharaoh's resisting the power of God was his, his own fault. So let, let me just summarize this first section. The other two sections will go quicker, I promise. But here's kind of my summary, is that actions belong to us, outcomes belong to God. Do, do you get that? Actions belong to us. Uh, we, we are called to do things. We are called to obey. We are called to engage with God's world. And nevertheless, we must always keep in mind that as much as it is imperative that we obey the Lord, nevertheless, outcomes are of Him. Because He is the sovereign God of the universe. Despite the fact that Pharaoh is going to harden his heart, there is still something for Moses to do. Well, let's look now at the second, uh, the second uh, story, which I call a bizarre death threat. And this is a, there's a lot of, th th there's some weird things in the Bible, but like this is real weird, okay? Um, and, and it starts in, in verse 24. It's very perplexing. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, that is God, let him, that is Moses, alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Weird. 
this is weird. Like, this is just bizarre. I mean, there's no, no two ways around it. So, hang on. What is it that happened? Like, everything was going fine. God said, okay, Moses, you're, you're going to go, and you're going to stand before Pharaoh, and, and you're going to tell him to let my people go. And Moses says, very well, I'm ready to go. And then the very next verse, and God sought to kill him as he went. What on earth is happening here? Um, well, happily, the honest answer is we don't know, right? So we don't know exactly what's going on. So we have to make some educated guesses. So I'm going to give you my best educated guess. Um, and, and let's ask this kind of back into the problem, sort of like parallel park. Okay, what do we know with certainty? What, what do we know with certainty? Well, we know with certainty that Moses failed to circumcise his son. We know that he had two sons. He had Gershom and he had Eliezer. We don't know which one, but uh, it, a lot of people think it was probably Gershom. But we know that he did not, he, he failed to circumcise his son. And now I'm going to speculate. Um, it's possible that Moses was thinking, well, I'm not even among my people. I'm not among the children of Israel. So who really cares about the covenant? Isn't that sort of a, you know, a thing to do when you're around other, other Jews? Right? You know, I'm, I'm over here in Midian in this kind of pagan land, so who really, who really cares? Maybe that's what, what he thought. We don't know. All we know is he failed to circumcise his son. We know that Moses' Midianite wife, she was not of, of the people of Abraham. We know that his Midianite wife, Zipporah, carried out this ritual, and she seemed a little put out by it. I mean, she's angry at Moses, almost like saying, Moses, you have put us in great risk, in great jeopardy, Right? We, we know that. And this is almost kind of, kind of poignant. Um, we also know that in so doing, she saved the prophet's life. She saved Moses' life. That's what verse 26 says, that God let him alone after that. Boy, I mean, what a scary thing. When God seeks to kill you, like, you better watch out, right? And, and, and thankfully, it was, it was Zipporah saying, there's something not right here, my husband. There's something not right this is sanctified imagination, but kind of bear with me. I wonder if, if Zipporah is, is thinking to herself, you know, Moses, you have told me about this great and wonderful God, this God who binds himself through his promises and his covenants with his people. And you've told me that the sign of the covenant is this, this ritual of circumcision, right? And, and now you're going you're gonna to leave and you're going to go and, and follow this God. You're going to uproot our family so that we can go serve God. And yet you've not even observed the sign of the covenant? What's with you, Moses? Right? I'm sure there's a lot of wives that are shaking their heads saying, yeah, that's right, my husband is that way, you know? Or a lot of daughters are saying like, yeah, my dad is kind of this way sometimes. Well, the, the fact is all of us can, can be this way. So why was Moses' failure to circumcise his son such a big deal? Why was it a big deal? Well, mainly because God is a God of his word. He's a God of, of his pro, who keeps his promises. He's a God who makes covenants um, with his children, with his people. See, whatever God says, we can stake our lives on it, that, that it, will, it will be true, that it will come to pass if God says that it's going to come to pass. And the sign of the covenant was circumcision, right? That was, that was the indicator, the sign that you were in, engaged in a relationship with God in, in those days. So for Moses to disregard this ritual was tantamount to Moses disregarding the character of God. And this is such a serious thing that, that to God, this is a capital crime, right? I mean, that's why it says that he sought to kill Moses because of Moses' disobedience. And I, we thank God literally for, for Zipporah, for Moses' wife. Um, she was the only reason that he wasn't killed by God. So think of it this way. Like, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh with confidence that God is behind you, that, that, that God, has, God has, your, has your back, um, and yet you've neglected your part of the covenant, right? You've neglected this half of, of, the, of the deal. Are you really going to speak to Pharaoh on behalf of the God whom you are presently disobeying? Right? You think that's a good move? Well, Moses wasn't bothered by it. But, but the importance, here's kind of the point, the importance of the covenant is so important that it's as if the whole plan of redemption is put on pause until Moses sets his house in order. 
Maybe Moses thought, well, come on, God, like I'm kind of your special servant, right? You're going to use me to deliver your people. So like, we don't have to worry with all these little details. No, 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 Moses, not, not at all, not at all. So since the covenant is an expression of God's faithfulness to his promises, we should learn from this that it, this is, it's a serious thing for, for you and me, for any of us, to, to disbelieve the God of, of the covenant. That's a real serious infraction against him. So let's turn to, to, to this last, this third lesson. What, what I call it is a worshipful reunion. A worshipful reunion, starting, starting in verse 27. The Lord said to Aram, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. It's likely, folks, that they had not seen each other for a whole generation, for 40 years. This was no doubt a happy reunion. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Okay, so they've not seen each other for decades. Moses and Aaron have this happy reunion. Moses catches him up and says, Aaron, God has called me, and, and you're coming with me, buddy. Um, my, my, my younger brother, uh, we're going to go to Pharaoh. And, and thankfully, um, it says in verse 31 that the people believe. So Moses does the signs, and the people are convinced. They, they believe God, and they believe Moses for now. Right, It's not going to last forever, but for now, they are believing it. And I love this expression that when they, when they heard that God had finally come to them, what did they do? They bowed their heads and they worshipped. Now, there are, there are three places in Exodus where this exact same expression, that the people heard something or experienced something, and they bowed in immediate worship before God. Um, and the, the first one... Uh, is um, well is, is is here, but another one is in Exodus chapter twelve, uh, verse twenty seven, where Moses goes through this explanation of the Passover. This is how you're supposed to kill the animal. This is what it signifies, and lays out uh, lays out exactly what uh, what what God is doing through the Passover. And after this description in uh, twelve twenty seven, it says, after they heard these things, then the children of Israel bowed their heads and worshipped. Right? So that's one place. And another one is in Exodus 34, verse 8. If you remember, um, uh, you know, what's, well, if you know what's to come in Exodus, you know that at one point Moses asks God uh, for his name. What is your name? And, and God tells him in, in Exodus 34. And God passes in front of Moses in all of his glory. And he proclaims his attributes. He proclaims who he is. And then right as that's happening, in 34.8, it says, Moses quickly bowed his head toward earth, and he worshipped. That's the, the final place. But of course, um, right here is the first time where it happens. The children of Israel have been um, just desolated um, for generation after generation of enslavement in Egypt. They've been in great weariness because of their bondage, and they hear the message that God has come back. The God of the covenant, he is, he's coming back to, to keep his word and to free you, and they worship. And you know what? Verse 31 gets at the heart, gets at the goal of the whole Exodus event, and that is worship. I mean, that is the reason that God told uh, Moses to go rescue his people so that they might be free to go out into the wilderness and to worship the living God. See, they're saved from something for something. They're saved from slavery for worship. And you know what? It's the very same thing with us today. If, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is, that, that is true of you today, just as it was true of the children of Israel thousands of years ago. You see, God doesn't like rescue us and forgive us and draw us to his son, Jesus Christ, and, and forgive us so that we can then just sort of go our, our own way. That, that's, that's, that's not how God is, not, not at all. Uh, in fact, for God to allow us to continue going our own course of life, that would be for us to continue being in bondage and in slavery. No, God has actually liberated us from the power of sin, from the power of darkness in, in our lives. 
Um, you know, I, I didn't, when, when I came to faith, I didn't ask Jesus to, you know, forgive me so that I could then go and, and live my own way and do the things that I wanted to do. Um, not at all. Running my own life was a, was a failure, right? I was the one who got me into that mess. It's like, I need you, Lord, to forgive me, but then to take control of my life. Now, people who are not religious hear this and they say, oh my gosh, like that's bondage, you know? Like some, some, some God that you have to answer to? Like that, that's not freedom, that's, that's bondage. Well, well, ironically, that's the only true freedom that, that there is. Um, one uh, a Puritan who wrote um, hundreds of years ago, he said that in Jesus' service alone is perfect freedom. In Jesus' service alone is perfect freedom. And, and um, the Apostle Paul, I'll mention this very quickly in, in, in Romans chapter 6, he, he challenges us to consider our lives before, before Christ. And listen to what he, he writes to the Christians at Rome. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, we're all slaves to somebody. We're all slaves to somebody. We're either slaves to our own passions, which is true bondage, or we're slaves to a loving, living God. And that's true freedom. He says, the fruit that you get as a slave to God, leads to sanctification and its end or its goal, eternal life. See, the, the fruit that results from a life of, of sin is, is shame and death. But a whole new life is opened up for you. And that comes through Jesus Christ as you live a life of worship. And the fruit that comes from that is a life of, of joy, of peace, and, and wholeness with the promise of eternal life. And I want to just apply this very quickly because a new vacuum has opened up in all of our lives, right? In just the past week or two. I mean, I looked at my schedule and it's like, I'm erasing just about everything because so many meetings I can't go, go to. And, and I wonder if it's the same for you. I'm, I'm sure it, 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 probably, it probably is. Um, how will you spend your time in the upcoming days and weeks and maybe even months how will you spend your time? Do you have any plans? And what role does God play in that? What role does God uh, play in this free time of yours that will probably open up? Maybe this is a, a good way to, uh, to apply this uh, today. Is, is the trajectory of your life one that is directing you toward the worship of God? Or are all the things that you're involved in, all the things that you're busy with, actually leading you away or, or, or keeping you in the same place? Both of those are bad. We are called for this to be uh, our daily occupation. And if that's not for you, why not this morning ask God uh, w with the power of His indwelling Holy Spirit to make some, some profound changes um, in your life. I want to close by, by saying very briefly that there are some remarkable parallels between Moses rescuing the children of Israel out of Egypt and Jesus rescuing his followers. Uh, there's two verses that we didn't talk about, and I'm just going to read them and say one thing about them. Um, it's Exodus 4.22. We passed over it, <clears throat> but Moses says this. <clears throat> then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that is Israel, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. See, God says to Pharaoh, set my son, that is Israel, free, or I will take your son's life. But God says to you, and he says to me, I will set you free through giving you my son's life. Very different. He said that again. God says to Pharaoh, set my son free or I will take your son's life. But God says to you this morning, I will set you free through giving you my son's life. Um, have you received the, the son? And, and if so, then you are a, a free person. You're a free man. You're a free woman. And that's exactly what Jesus was getting at in John chapter 8 where he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you have not ever received the Son, if you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, then, then I invite you, I, I, I urge you,
to, to, um, to, to own the, the, the liberty and the freedom that comes to you through knowing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, there are uh, some odd things in your word, but I know that all of them are for our benefit. And I pray that you would take your word this morning and that you would apply it to our lives, apply it to our hearts and our souls, and that you might transform us through the good news about Jesus. Lord, I do pray for my church that you would keep us safe, that you would keep us uh, free from this plague that is spreading across the world, Lord God. I pray for those who are living in fear that they would turn their sights to you, Lord God, the God of life, the God of death, but the God who has loved his children so much that no matter what comes our way, we know that we have uh, freedom in you and that our safety is ultimately found only in your presence. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.